Ugh, you've done enough damage to this franchise. Just let me make this video, please. In hindsight, 2008 was a really nice year for me. I got into the Kingdom Hearts franchise, played Kingdom Hearts 2, I was confused out of my mind. I finally got Super Smash Bros. Brawl, man, that was a long wait, so many delays. And yet, the pain I felt from a certain show still lingers inside of me. I'll never forget how much my passion and love for gaming truly blossomed so voluptuously. It's the kind of sensational pleasure I haven't really felt in a long time. This could be due to how I perceive new experiences now, given how much knowledge and maturity I've gained over the last 12 years, although I realize how much I still lack the knowledge department. That isn't to say that I'm a depressed, sad person who can't ever hope to be excited for new video games, movies, and TV shows, but what's the point? If my favorite show ever got cancelled, or a video game failed to be properly developed, or even got cancelled too, that would show just how wasted my time was for obsessing over these products fit purely for consumption and nothing more. Because when you break it down at the end of the day, fighting game characters are just functions and nothing really matters. Ah, okay, fuck that. You know, I don't mean to sound so negative. I mean, I wouldn't say that's entirely accurate, but it's just not the right way to think about it, right? Sure, these are products, but people making these said products do it for more than just monetary value. These are very powerful people who want to express creativity and passion into what they specialize in, and see it as their duty to deliver the best product, show, whatever media that they can. After one such product, show known as Firefly, was cancelled, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was a big joke, and the parent company, 20th Century Fox, was just waiting to revive the show. I really thought they would, but they never did. My childhood innocence around that point was starting to go away, and the cancellation certainly didn't help. I mean, watching a show like Firefly at a young age in the first place was probably not the most ideal thing to do if I was aiming on preserving my childlike mind. But uh, then again, I never said I was, and I actually really enjoyed the show. As I've gotten older, I do find myself appreciating and understanding Firefly more, but at the same time, it's increasingly difficult to discuss this show because... It's just so hard to even conceive a video like this. I can't help but be reminded of how I felt about this show and how it was abused. Left and right, Fox riddled the actors and producers with misery and issues that could have been avoided, but weren't unfortunately. Fox canceled this show after just one season. When it was gone, there was a huge backlash from fans, which resulted in the one season show getting a sequel movie, which, yeah, as great as it was, it wasn't enough to revive the franchise. Me and I have have an agreement. If one of us dies, we stage it to look like a suicide caused by the unjust cancellation of Firefly. We're gonna get that show back on the air, buddy. I mean, we could do that, but, like, you know, I, I really don't want to die. And besides, I doubt Firefly would be brought back just like that, even if someone did do a suicide pact. Judging from the comments alone, it seems like many are interested, but trust me, it's a wasted effort. No matter how you look at it, this is a very mature-rated show, and a niche one at that. Now that the rights are owned by Disney due to the company buyout, yeah, they won't revive the show. It was already not so popular, and there's hardly any monetary incentive to revive a show like this. And even if they do end up rebooting the show, yeah, they'll probably end up ruining what made Firefly so unique and fascinating to begin with. But just what does make this show so unique and fascinating? I'm glad you asked. Well, allow me to explain. Firefly is a space western drama that follows an ensemble cast of a whopping nine characters. All of them are a part of a renegade crew that flies under the spaceship known as Serenity. In the year 2517, where space travel is feasible and as a result, countless planets have been inhabited by humans. No aliens though, we don't have any men in black type shit going on here. The elements of the space opera and western genre are mixed in, but also interwoven with eastern influences. Namely, with Mandarin Chinese being a prominent language many characters speak in the show. <laughs> Supposedly, in the show's lore, this was the result of China and the United States being the two biggest superpowers on Earth that expanded into space. And as a result, a union was formed between the two nations, which is famously dubbed in this show as the Alliance. The Alliance ultimately is what allowed for the population of Mandarin speakers to grow in size exponentially. This is why the protagonists may say words or phrases in Mandarin, although I wouldn't know what they're saying without subtitles since I've never learned Mandarin. So a lot of the dialogue in this show I find pretty unique. Get these anti-heroes were following to utter wisecracks and cheeky phrases in western styled accents, but then they naturally sneak in some Chinese in there. It may not be for everyone, but the vision was there, 
And I honestly think the creator of the show, Joss Whedon, did an excellent job of blending vastly different cultures so seamlessly. You may know Joss Whedon from other movies and shows that involve other ensemble casts. You probably remember him the most from stuff like The Avengers and Justice League. Ugh. There are many influences Whedon had when creating the show, such as the classic John Ford film, Stagecoach, which chronicled a group of strangers going through the Old West. A group of strangers. Hmm. Yeah, I could definitely see that as an influence. He also came up with the concept for this show after reading a book called The Killer Angels, a historical novel which was about the Battle of Gettysburg during the American Civil War. After finishing the book, he was inclined to write a story about a group of people who were on the losing side of a war. Not necessarily the Civil War, but just a fictional war of his choosing. Although interestingly enough, there are also influences, or if not, then similarities to other space western shows from Japan, namely Outlaw Star and Cowboy Bebop. All three of these shows follow a group of characters that set in a futuristic time period on a spaceship and have western influences trickled in here and there. Not to say anything's been plagiarized, uh, no I'm not saying that at all. Technically every movie, storyline, play, radio drama, I mean they're all more or less ripoffs of Shakespeare who got his stories off of the legends of the Greeks and Romans. The similarities keep on going if you study down history, and I know anyone can use this argument to defend any story they like, but my point is, there are some similarities between these shows, particularly with Outlaw Star, but hey, that's okay. Nothing's been copied, and I can clearly see these are very different shows that have things in common here and there, yet differ completely story-wise and thematically, so I can give it a pass. I mean, it just goes to show how well westerns and space operas go together. Why else would there be a variety of shows that have that specific blend of genres? If you're a stranger to my channel, then you may not know this, but I like watching shows and movies that follow a ragtag group of characters. I find it fascinating to see just how the writers can explore who these people are, and how their personalities and multi-layered motivations bounce off each other. But whereas Outlaw Star and Cowboy Bebop, and even by extension, the show where Cowboy Bebop's sole origin is derived from, Lupin the Third, all follow a ragtag group of mercenaries slash cowboys slash, you know, whatever kind of criminal I didn't mention, who aren't necessarily heroes, but also aren't evil and have their own lives that are filled with realistic moral ambiguity. What I find to be a clear and arguably vital distinction that sets apart Firefly from many other shows and films that I've seen, and what made this show to me truly monumental and the reason it's kept alive to this very day, is the chemistry. The chemistry these characters have is out of this world. It's exquisite just how fine-tuned and perfect these characters fit smoothly together, despite the harshly limited runtime this show's first and only season had. To fully explain what I'm talking about, uh, let me give you a rundown of the nine members. And it's okay if you don't remember all of these names, I'm just gonna speed run through them. Just know their faces. You've got the leader of Serenity, the anti-hero Captain Malcolm Reynolds. Uh, no relation, but uh, they've got some nice bromance going on. Also, he's a badass. He's got that I don't give a damn kind of attitude that I've come to respect for a renegade protagonist. Then you've got Zoe Washburn, the captain's right hand woman who served with him in a past war, making her and the captain both war veterans. Then there's Hoban Washburn, who's the husband of Zoe and the pilot of the ship. Inara works as a companion, which is basically a professional prostitute? She's kind of like a potential but awkward love interest for the captain, given her profession. Then there's Jane Cobb, the more brutish, muscular mercenary who isn't always the most loyal member out there, but still helps when it counts. Kaylee Fry, the sweet and wholesome mechanic. Shepherd Book, who, as his name would suggest, is a shepherd who tags along the crew for his own curiosity. The actor that played him, Ron Glass, passed away a few years back. Rest in peace. And finally, the last two members, Simon Tam, a doctor who saved his kidnapped sister and takes the both of them onto his ship to escape law enforcement for whatever nefarious purposes the government intends on having with Simon's younger sister, River Tam. The crew here try to take on any job they can to get money so they can keep their ship running. Because their vehicle is independent and not a part of any Alliance issued ship, they do come into conflict with the police of this universe several times, either because of the aforementioned younger sister who the government wants to kidnap, or just because they're renegades. The captain of the ship, Mal, does take on many smuggling jobs and is responsible for killing several people. So each of these characters have already broken the law in some way, and by traveling and supporting the ship, they only continue to do so, which puts them in very tense and suspenseful situations. The connections all nine characters share together is interesting and powerful enough to keep this show fresh and engaging, even though we've only got 14 episodes. I don't want to spoil too much, but I will say, these episodes do a great job of developing who these people are 
and making them relatable, like one big family, even though they have entirely different pasts, ambitions, and chips that rest on their shoulders, some more obvious than others. How do they show this though? Eh, again, I can't spoil much. If you like the distant yet uniting bonds the ragtag characters in Cowboy Bebop had, you could very easily come to understand what makes the characters in Firefly so special. But I would have to argue Firefly had a stronger bond between everyone. The characters here feel three dimensional, and while some of them are not exactly pure and righteous, you can get attached to these characters very easily. The family component I stated earlier attests to this, as you do get to really feel for the many hardships these characters face. Some episodes aim to capture the backstories and tribulations several of these protagonists had to go through before coming aboard Serenity and effectively give them depth that would make an MCU fan cry on prom night. Okay, that was pretty uncalled for. Actually, I'll have to apologize. Ripping off of a joke that was already trashy from terrible promoters. Seriously, what was Deep Silver thinking? Really? Anime fan on prom night? Wow. Yeah, no wonder this game flopped. I do stand firmly behind the idea that, yes, this is the best thing Joss Whedon has worked on. The best thing that's managed to please me above all the other superhero slash buffy work he's done. That's subjective, I know, but hey, this is just one of the reasons why I'm talking to you about this show right now. So if Firefly is seemingly wonderful and has amazing characters and stories, then what happened? Why did it get cancelled? Well, there are many reasons. Most of them seem to come from Fox. Yep, studio interferences plague the show like crazy. Writing off of the success of shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and its spin-off, Angel, Fox executives wanted another, well, not necessarily a supernatural drama, but a show that would be an instant hit with those existing fans and gain new viewership. These guys wanted to make the big bucks, which is definitely plausible for any company. However, they didn't have much faith in a show about a bunch of smugglers in outer space just trying to live freely. Sure, critics loved the show and gave nice reviews, but it wasn't enough to gain ratings to keep the show afloat. The biggest problem in my eyes was Fox's attitude. They decided to not only give Firefly one season, but only allow the show to be shown on Fridays at 8pm for just a one hour block. For that one hour block, the press they did was humiliating. The song they chose for this commercial right here, Smash Mouth's Walking on the Sun, that doesn't match at all what the show was about. If you don't recognize who Smash Mouth is, well, they also made this classic. Granted, uh, commercials were a bit different back then, but still, I can tell you this is a terrible way to present the franchise. Why use a song like this for a gritty space western sci-fi? No, this doesn't fit at all. Even when they did broadcast this show, they aired the episodes out of order. We didn't make this show have episodes play off of each other deliberately, so that it really only made sense to watch the episodes in order, something that holds true for pretty much nearly every show ever conceived. Eh, except for Bakano. That shit's confusing. But in hindsight, if you watch that series in order, it does sort of make sense. I mean, if they aired the episodes of Steins Gate out of order, that would just mess with my head. The show is already confusing as it is. Airing these episodes out of order didn't bode too well for Firefly. And they even aired the pilot as the very last broadcast to run on Fox's programming back when the show was first on the TV. Yeah, that's really confusing. Why would they do that? But even when they did air the show, at the terrible Friday death slot, as it was called, and with all the lackluster promotion they had for it, they didn't even air the entire series. Firefly in its entirety had 14 episodes for its only season, but Fox didn't want to air all the episodes, they only showed 11 of them before pulling the show after terrible viewer ratings. And there's even more to it than that. Fox aired Firefly out of order, right? The pilot episode for the show was supposed to be the two-hour pilot known as Serenity which carefully set up all nine members. However, Fox found that unsuitable and opted to make The Train Job the pilot episode instead. They wanted Firefly to be known as a more action comedic show with slight mature themes, instead of the gritty and serious character study we didn't want it to be. That's probably the biggest problem right there. The worst thing Fox or any corporation could ever do with a show. Interfering with the writing and mixing in BS business practices, all for the sake of making sure they get the dough. I'm not kidding, that's why they did all this. For the money. As any company would hope for, and it's all plausible on paper. Except, messing around with the show, going as far as tampering with the creative spirit so deeply is ultimately what costed them the most at the end of the day. With bad press and just terrible organization, it's no wonder people didn't bother to watch the show when it originally aired. 
They were confused on what this was about, and from the little understanding they were able to salvage from Fox's botched attempts at marketing, they expected something like Buffy, since that's what Joss Whedon was known for at the time. <laughs> Hell, even the sequel movie Fox Greenlit, Serenity, which was the last time we ever saw these actors in these roles, they just had to make mention of Buffy in the spin-off series Angel on the promotional material, as if to say, Oh yeah, if you like these shows, you're definitely gonna like this movie. Yeah, thanks Fox. That's marketing 101, I guess. Anything to drive the masses. Although this movie, just like the show, massively flopped. Besides not getting good press, People were just generally not interested in this kind of story at the time. It was definitely too niche and failed to find its audience during its runtime. I saw the film and it actually wasn't that bad. It was definitely true to the show's spirit and pretty much felt like an extended episode of the show. But uh, once again, it just didn't have the audience. I'm kind of confused that they didn't name the movie Firefly the Movie Serenity. Serenity all on its own could easily confuse the masses. Maybe Fox wanted to try and advertise this as a sci-fi film to more than just the fan base the show established. Tough luck there, you kinda have to understand the show first in order to watch this film. The cover alone I guess would definitely get Firefly fans pumped, I know it did for me. And yeah, like I said, this bombed, big time, barely made its budget. But the most egregious thing I personally found Fox interfering with was the relationship between Zoe and Hope and Washburn. Fox executives reportedly weren't pleased that they were married in the show, and they told Whedon if he didn't get rid of the marriage, the show would be cancelled. In the Firefly DVD commentary, Joss Whedon admitted that, Then don't pick up my show, because in my show these people are married. Fox, however, didn't cancel Firefly because of their relationship. It was because of the terrible viewer ratings. Which is ironic since they largely contributed to this mess in the first place. I guess it's pretty clear why Fox executives didn't want these two in a relationship, uh... It's not something I like, but I guess back then, you know, having interracial couples was definitely seen as a very, very risky business move. Uh, well, not not even a, it wasn't even a good business strategy to begin with, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful, you know, a lot of shows and movies nowadays are very open, very open to having these kinds of things, and uh, it's a shame that that was even brought up in the first place, because there was nothing wrong with it, you know, these two actors have such great chemistry, you can see it from the very first episode even, uh, I can't believe they wasted time arguing about this, uh, but... Ah, well. I think it would be too arrogant to come out and say this, but ah, fuck it. The show was ahead of its time. Firefly was the underdog, not just of Fox programming, but of all broadcasting at the time. It never ranked too high on ratings, and most people didn't even know about the show's existence when it was on air. Yet the show still had critical success. I do have appreciation for a lot of niche-related content that I otherwise find just as, if not more than, enjoyable than the current mainstream appeal. I'm not the type of person to hate something simply because it's too mainstream. I do know people like this in my life though, where they just kinda hate all the hype and promotion for blockbuster films or celebrated shows. They despise how others perceive the sensationalism with joy and crowd around how epic and great all these movies and shows are, even though they arguably could be glorifying it a little too much. People who don't like mainstream content though purposely go for the unusual pick the movie or show that isn't as popular or even successful, and they believe the mantra that different is cool. I personally try to strike a balance between my preferences when it comes to big time superhero action packed movies, the offices, you know. I don't look down on mainstream stuff, I see the appeal, but I also make sure to turn my attention towards the more subtle and also praiseworthy niche related content that I've come to respect over the years. On my channel, I made it very clear how much I like Lupin the Third. That anime is great, and I respect the creator is still producing that show to this very day, and how even if it may not have appeal in the states, it's got huge support from its home country, Japan. That and Italy, and I guess France too. But the point is, I made those videos about the show with the implication that it's okay. It's fine that the show is niche. Would I like Lupin to have widespread acclaim and fame? Yeah, sure. If the show wasn't so niche, that'd be awesome. I do wonder if something would be taken away though, if its charm would be gone. Still, I'm naturally inclined to feel persistent about niche content that I like, getting more spotlight, but I understand that this can't always happen, either due to funding or inadequate advertising. However, in this particular situation though, when it comes to this show, I'm irate. It's not fair. Firefly was doomed to fail from the start. It was fighting a battle from the very moment it was aired. Fox was intent on making sure the show had absolutely zero chance of ever succeeding. From the terrible promotion to just horrible decisions to air the episodes out of order and do it at a time slot so tiny. 
barely anyone ever knew the show even existed. The franchise is done. It's over. Now that Fox was bought out by Disney, things are over for good. If they ever brought the show back, it just wouldn't be the same. And there doesn't really seem to be a need to anyways. Joss Whedon has no plans to revive the show. Man, he's got bigger projects to focus on anyways. It's never coming back. And yet, it's not over. I was too young to know this at the time, but Firefly had an insanely large fandom. The show touched so many people, at least the ones that did manage to watch this somehow. People campaigned, protested, anything they could to get Fox's attention that, yeah, they love this show and it deserves to still be on air. Fox eventually responded when they brought it back for one movie, which, uh, like I said earlier, wasn't the biggest financial success. It doesn't matter if the movie was a critical success and enjoyable for fans. If it didn't make enough money, Fox knew they were going to nix the show. That was back in 2005. A year later, a documentary film known as Done the Impossible was released. It focused on just how large and dedicated the fandom was for Firefly, interviewing countless fans and even the actors and producers involved. There was still hope in these people, regardless of the fact that Firefly was never going to have another season or movie again. Firefly was also going to get a video game that was being developed for Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android devices. Quantum Mechanics, the publisher and main developer, alongside Sparkplug Games, had plans to release Firefly Online in Spring 2015. They were going to bring back the original actors to provide voice acting and attempt to revive the show's appeal. However, time passed and that game still hasn't been released yet. It was never officially cancelled, but Firefly Online's Facebook page did mention they were still developing the game. That was back in 2016, so much like the original show, fans assumed all hope had vanished. If there's anything that did continue for the franchise though, it's the comics. From 2005 to 2017, publisher Dark Horse Comics started making these graphic novels to help expand on Firefly's lore, and explain things that were otherwise left ambiguous or underdeveloped due to Fox cancelling the show so early on. You remember the character I talked about, Shepard Booker, one of the nine crew members of Serenity? The religious guy? Well, he got his much deserved origin story told through the comics. It's something that I'm actually pretty grateful to have. So in terms of Firefly ever coming back, yeah, no. It's dead in space. I'd like to think if there's anything I've learned from the persistence of fans to keep the show alive, from not only the documentary, but just all the love and support fans online have kept up for this franchise, even to this very day, is that this show will still exist in the hearts of fans, as it does for me. I'm fine with the fact that Firefly is niche and only got one season. It hurts to say that, it really does, but I'm just glad Firefly never went through the usual arc that so many popular shows get to. You know what I'm talking about, it's in later seasons when the premise gets stale, leading to terrible and overdone arcs that really don't make any sense and clearly were done for a show that's run out of material. Firefly never had the luxury to run for too long, but thankfully it didn't get burned out either. I'm not going to make the argument that Joss Whedon and his team of writers would eventually run out of lore and material to work with. I mean, we'll never know, seeing as how Firefly was cut so soon. Some may argue that Firefly is too overrated to be niche. A bit of a paradox, but eh, I'll bite. And people say that it's not actually that great of a show. And that judgment is up to the viewer. Personally for me, I really like this show for the gritty character study you want it to be. Yeah, I could see people complaining about the CGI, even though the show came out in the early 2000s and I can excuse it. Or perhaps that the plot and mixing of sci-fi and western just doesn't work. For me at least it did, but hey, it's not going to work for everybody, that's okay. I already like shows anyways that have a similar feel and premise, like Cowboy Bebop, so I knew this show would probably be up my alley. But it was more than that. I really do like the family that the Serenity crew formed, and I found that the writing in many episodes were way above my expectations. Some may not like the witty and quick-paced dialogue, but Whedon definitely left room for character growth and did a great job highlighting pivotal moments that showcased just how unique and well-made Firefly was. I know that perhaps I'm overhyping the series and maybe uh, maybe you may not like it. Uh, it's, not, it's not for everybody, but it's a show that I think a lot of people who like uh, picaresque kind of themed worlds uh, or stories like uh, Ocean's Eleven or... Cowboy Bebop, or even stuff like uh, even the Italian job, you know? You follow a group of outlaws, they're doing something illegal, but you find them likable. It, uh, that's all you can really ask for in a show like this. And But the show manages, for, for me personally, it manages to just go, it goes above what I expected, you know? I'll leave a link in the description for uh, Hulu, iTunes, and Amazon Prime. Those three places have uh, Firefly, all 14 episodes in the correct viewing order, as Joss Whedon intended. 
Uh, like I said earlier, you know, when they first aired Firefly on uh, television, unfortunately it was aired out of order and they only aired 11 episodes. But thankfully now you can watch all 14 episodes in the correct order. So it's pretty good. Also with this video, I'm not trying to demean Fox executives. I know the thumbnail picture of this video may suggest that and throughout the video I have left some very insidious remarks about Fox. You know, they are partially responsible if not uh, mostly responsible for the damage Firefly has taken, but if Firefly came out nowadays, it would probably be more successful, and we'd probably get more seasons, but, uh, yeah, it was just kind of like a wrong time kind of thing. It came out at the wrong time, but that's okay. I think we, st we still have something, and it's nice to, uh, it's nice that we can watch that. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, I know I said I would make videos weekly, but given that college has started, online exams and homework are very strange to deal with and finding time to make videos is becoming harder i'll try to manage my time better anyways uh, like comment subscribe if you want to but you don't have to have a great day see you everybody uh, catch you on the flip side